Now we will use these hardware characteristics to assess performance. Therefore I will introduce you a very simple model and approach to assess performance of an observation. Our key question is whether or not observed performance of an application is acceptable. By acceptable we mean is it good or bad. So for your car for instance and in terms of speed you have a very simple way of verifying that your car drives sufficiently fast and works to some extent. When you go to a motorway and you accelerate with the maximum gear to the highest speed possible, you look at your tachometer and you would say this is 10 kilometers per hour, you would probably think something is broken. However, this kind of assessment strategy here is very difficult to grasp in a computer system often. Therefore, this methodology will help you to boil down the problem and into a similar kind of approach that we did with your car looking at your tachometer. So the approach is we start with a very simple model. By doing so we have five steps. First we measure the time for executing a workload, whatever that workload may be, so it can be an application. Next we quantify the workload with some metrics. For example the amount of tuples or data that it has processed, the amount of computation operations needed to do these operations, like how many additions or so on. Sometimes we may actually use statistics that are gathered by a monitoring system such as Hadoop or Spark. All these numbers give us then an idea to quantify the workload. We can say I, I process 60 gigabytes um, and I know I did an addition for each of these values, for example. Next we compute the workload that we are able to process per time. Then we compute an expected performance based on the system's hardware characteristics that we learned about. Now all we need to do is to compare this workload that we process per time with the expected performance. We can compute a derived metric such as efficiency where we divide the actual measured workload with the capabilities. And when we get a number that is very small, for example 1, that means we actually use 1% of the available expected performance. Actually in computing 1% isn't that bad to be honest. Um, there, are, there are computations where this is actually much much worse as you will see. But of course the best value would be 1 which means we would get 100% efficiency barely possible. Now with this simple strategy you can actually refine this model and you can include details about the intermediate step, quantify the workload better or the expected performance better and so on. But it gives you really a similar feeling as in your car when you look at the tachometer then you have an idea if it is generally broken or not. So now let's use this kind of knowledge to first assess a compute, simple compute task only. So in this I show you some performance measures um, where you find the reference that are reported by a vendor that sh should show the improvement that has been done with um, a new version and comparing Spark with Python and Scala. So what this job here does, it aggregates 10 million integers using one thread. Here you can see the time in seconds. So with using RDDs in Python you take 9 seconds. You, using RDDs in Scala you take 4. Using data frames which is, which is the Spark 2 API you get 2 seconds which seems Wow, it's now about four times faster than with Python using RDDs. So the question is, can we trust such numbers? Are these numbers really good? So is two seconds now, obviously it's much faster than before, but is it now a good number? So I, I would ask you to, for yourself now, think about this model. Think about this little basic approach that we've done here and try to digest these numbers and find a solution how you would assess if they are good or bad. Pause the video for maybe three minutes, think about it. You can also chat obviously in Teams with someone else posting questions. Then please continue now. So let's do a little computation here. So when we when we look at Spark, we, we can in this 
little paper, we do a little math, we see that it processes data at 160 megabyte per second, which means we need 500 compute cycles per operation. And in fact, you know, when we you can invoke additional external programming languages, which takes even more time. So by Spark, right, we can use additional tools. So now let's do a couple of benchmarks. So when we use Python in a raw in raw nature and, and time it, we would get the 10 million integers in one thread processed in 0 0.44 seconds, which means 727 megabytes per second, about 123 cycles per operation. When you use NumPy, which is an optimized library for math, well, we get 0 0.014 seconds, which actually corresponds to four cycles per operation. And then you can compare this with the memory bandwidth of the machine and you see that it achieves 22.8 gigabyte a second, which is pretty close to what we talked about before in hardware. When you have, for example, a specific DDR4 DIMM, well, they can achieve something like 25 gigabyte a second. Well, of course, we have more channels, but it's not so bad, right? So this really is the memory bandwidth limit that is also provided by the chip. So here's the code. You can run it by yourself on your computer. So what can we conclude from it? Well, we can conclude that the big data solution here, which is Spark, is 125 times slower as anticipated, right? If I would have plotted how is NumPy doing, well, it would be pretty much here on the left side. Um, a drawback of NumPy is that it doesn't scale out so easily as using um, Spark. And depending on the workload that you have, you can actually combine these solutions. Right? But keep in mind that this here is rather inefficient. So this is 125 times slower than it should be. What is the improvement then? Right? It's like, wow, here is the new car. The new car now can drive with 10 kilometers per hour. That is terrific, right? If the car before could do only one, but still far away from the capabilities of a modern car in terms of peak performance. So I hope this already showed you um, how important those numbers are and that we can use different value cycles. We used the cycles, we used throughput a little bit, which was used for the memory bandwidth. Now we can use another strategy, extending it for a distributed system. Here we have performance values of running the Daytona gray sort, which sorts 100 terabyte of data in files and generates a new output files. This benchmark generates 500 terabyte of disk I.O. and 200 terabyte of network I.O. And the benchmark is itself not very compute intense, just to mention. It consists of data records, so this 100 terabyte data, they consist of 10 bytes of keys and 90 bytes of data, which means that in fact you have a 10 terabyte of key, 90 terabytes of data that is not needed for a comparison. What, you, what they of typically report is the sort rate in terabytes per minute. Here you see the performance numbers and they have to specify the runtime, the number of nodes it runs, that you have a better understanding, the performance of the disks, and they give you the sort rate. Now let's digest this result a little bit. So we see that it uh, with Hadoop it's 100 terabyte in 4000 seconds and we have 2100 nodes. That means we get a sort rate of 11 megabyte per second per node, that means one megabyte per hard disk drive. This is suboptimal because we expect from a hard disk drive, even in that era, to be giving something about a 100 megabyte a second. And a node, 11 megabyte a second, we see it has a network of 10 gigabits a second, which means it c should be able to do about one gigabyte per second, but it gets only 1%. So this is just 1% of the efficiency. Very inefficient. Now let's look at Apache Spark, uh, this, which is um, the first result. It took 1,400 seconds, and you can do the sort rate, which means 344 megabytes per second. Now we do a performance assessment. You get um, 687 megabytes per node in terms of performance. But optimally, we should be able to get 1.15 gigabytes per second per node. Why, how do we get to these numbers? Well, we know it actually does 200 
terabyte of network I.O. and we just divide these with the runtime and we, we see that we get a throughput over the whole application runtime for 680 maybe bytes per second. But this is, like I said here, this is about 50% of the optimal performance, which is quite good. And we have to consider that it's actually not possible to hide all the communication. So here we assume 200 terabytes are processed while the whole runtime of the application is done. So 1400 seconds. But not all the time the application tries to communicate. Now we can do the same computation, taking the 500 terabytes of storage and see that we get 200 maybe bytes per second per SSD, which is again quite decent, reasonable. When we go to compute, well, we would see we, we have to do 17 million records per second per node, which is 0 0.5 million records per second per core, which is about 4,700 cycles per record. So computation is really not well utilized, but of course we reach here the network and IO bandwidth. And by knowing that we, we need about 4,000 700 cycles per record, we probably could have reduced the number of cores used um, in this experiment. Where was it? 32 cores. Probably even four cores would have been enough. So now let's think about what we could do um, optimally. So to give an upper bound of the performance. Let's talk about an utopic algorithm. Assume we run on 200 nodes and we, we know the key distribution very well. Okay, first we have to, we know we have to read the input file. So we always have to read the input file once. Also, we, we know we have to output the data again once. But here we can output it to the local, fi to local files instead of somehow sending it over the network. Okay, so this is those two steps. Now let's talk about how we could start to process. So we basically start reading these input files that are distributed among these 200 nodes. We, once we start reading it, we immediately start figure out where, based on the key, where this key should be stored, on which node, and there we know where to store it in memory. So we have to basically transform the data once over the network, which means 100 terabyte needs to go over the network. So the receiving node would receive this data and store it in the likely or exact memory region because we know how these keys are distributed. That means we would have to store 500 gigabyte per node. We can actually pipeline this with the receiving. So let's think about the optimal runtime. So we have 500 gigabytes of data in terms of memory. And I and I O we keep well this throughput that was achieved and measured before. So how long would it take now? Well, we need 294 seconds to read the data. And we need 294 seconds to write the data because it's 100 terabytes. To scatter the data, we have to use 10 gigabit ethernet. Well, it's 400 seconds. But the good thing is once you start to scatter the data, well, the reading would continue. And so basically we can overlap those two phases and hide the time to read. So we would need for step one and two, in fact, just 400 seconds. Reading the memory and writing it to memory, well, main memory is extremely fast. So it would need only six seconds, so it doesn't really matter. So what we need to overlap is here, we need, after we've done the scattering of the data, we have basically all data sorted in main memory, and then we have to only write it out. That means the runtime is this phase plus this phase, makes in total 700 seconds, it's about 8.2 terabytes, terasorts per minute. And remember, the Spark already achieved 4.27 terabyte teras per minute which means it's highly was highly efficient so achieving about 50 percent of even an optimal algorithm that we can think about that's quite nice now here i have another group work or approach in which you which you should test and explore by yourself how you would assess the performance so here we have a benchmark done by ibm that was similar to the Apache benchmark, and they test several, several operations on data sets with increasing size, between 700 kilobytes to 62 gigabytes. So on the left side, you see the results in terms of seconds for pick, on the right side for hive. We see, for example, that it takes 32 seconds to do some arithmetic operations on set one, and for set three, we get 50 seconds. 
remember that 3 is about 100 times as big as that one. Here we can see pretty much an overhead to start the workload and tear down the workload. But at some point for larger sets, um, this short time doesn't play a role. Now, think about those operations on the left a little bit and think about those data sets. How, how would you model the performance? For your knowledge, they used basically five data and compute nodes. They were configured to run eight reducers and 11 map tasks. Most importantly is that they used five compute nodes, I think, and it doesn't matter about their performance. So how would you judge this runtime? Is this runtime good or bad? Break the video now, make a little break, and think about it for a couple of minutes, and then I will discuss it. So welcome back. So if you would do look at some of those numbers, you would find that these systems are both highly inefficient in this particular benchmark that has been performed quite a while ago. So let's take the biggest data set, 62 gigabyte, and take, for example, here, this filter operation, filter 90%. So what happens is you need to read the data, 62 gigabyte, right? And then you dispose 90% of it and write back, well, 6 gigabyte. So how fast is that? Well, divide 62 gigabyte with the runtime here, 1600 seconds, and you will see that this achieves actually a throughput of 40 megabytes per second for a very trivial operation as well, right? So this is not very convincing. And it's likewise for all these operations, you can see here extremely high numbers. So again, it's it's not always sufficient to say, oh, here, PIC is much faster than Spark, but it's really to think about this utilization and the efficiency, how much we can use our system. Because if you have a solution that is 10 times that efficient, you need 10 times less hardware to buy. That just makes it much cheaper. Good. Now, to conclude our performance discussion, here is one last thought. How do errors and we know errors are typical in a distributed system, how do they influence the processing time? So a very simple graph here illustrates what ha you have to do if a job breaks at run during runtime and you have to restart this job again until it completes. So we will take an error probability that is smaller than one. For example, zero, one means 10% error probability. And this then, how does this influence the processing time P? Okay, note that a rerun of a job might fail again, right? So you run, then while the job runs, it fails, and then it fails again. So an upper bound is given as P um, dash. So if an application, the runtime of an application depends on E, the error. So this is the probability of the error. Uh, but then what ha the, the chance that it happens again is e square. And then you have to take e um, to the power of 3, power of 4. This is basically a series. And you multiply this with p. And this results into p divided by 1 minus e. So this series here can be expressed like this. So now we can basically specify relative to p the runtime. And here you see on the x-axis the error probability between 0 and 1. 1 means 100%. And here you see the runtime relative to original p. So if there is error probability 0, well, the runtime is 1. So it takes p time to run your application. But if the error probability is, for example, 0 0.5, well, it takes, it is 2, the runtime overall to be expected. That seems not to be very special. But once you reach a very high error probability, you have to repeat and repeat because you always fail. And then the runtime basically explodes and this goes basically get towards infinity. I did stop with the plotting after 100. So remember that with 50% chance of error, twice the processing time is needed. With 90% chance of error, it's 10 times the processing times. So that means, for me, for practical reasons, you should, you must certainly always stick below 50% chance of errors. 